2016, and there was a record number of bracket-busting upsets this year that have made the madness extra maddening this March. I have with me, ladies and gentlemen, who I have been calling for years, my professional sports panel, Chad Rainwater, Zach Kahn, and Jordan Canasser. Guys, thank you so much for being here. We are broadcasting from the WLXU studios. Uh, I got my professional sports panel all joining me via Zoom. Let's go ahead and start with Zach Hahn. Zach, how's everything going? Going great, Adam. Always a pleasure to be here. I am going to have to correct you right off the bat, though. You said professional, and I know that's a word that we've used a few times. But the way my bracket's going this year, I'm definitely in the amateur category. <laughs> well, we'll talk about the brackets in just a second. Jordan, how are you? I'm wonderful, man. You know, glad to be back for another show. Uh, it's been, at least to say, a very interesting weekend in college basketball, and I can't wait to talk about it. Yes, sir. And last of all, we have Chad Rainwater joining us and and his kids as well in the background. Chad, how are you doing? Hey, man, I'm doing good. I'm glad to be back on the show. And I guess uh, you will hear, audience, you will hear some uh, kids in the background. Just please ignore that. Uh, that's what happens when you work remotely. So, but uh, I'm just glad to make it. You know, uh, like Jordan said, I'm glad to talk some uh, college basketball. We're very excited to have you here. But like I said, ladies and gentlemen, we have a Sweet 16. The Sweet 16 has been set, uh, but of course. While getting there, we saw a lot of upsets, a lot of surprises. Our brackets are all busted. Speaking of brackets, those of you who have joined the Off the Cuff Bracket Challenge, that is something that I was surprised to see 45 entrants uh, entered to the Bracket Challenge. I was expecting maybe five, six, seven, uh, and that's including us. But we actually had 45 participants enter the Off the Cuff Bracket Challenge. And the leaderboard right now, the guy or girl who is leading it, a uh, bilus winning coffee cup. I have no idea who that is. Uh, did you, one of you guys create a secret email and uh, posing to be bilus winning coffee cup? No, I wish I had, but it, no, it's Billis winning coffee cup. My my theory is that it's actually Jay Billis. Like <laughs> I, I I hope Jay Billis himself actually wins the off the cuff bracket pool. That would be awesome. <laughs> All I know is somebody felt real good about winning that. I'm telling you what, it's one of those things where I'm, I don't know. I think I'm ranked fourth. If I do win the bracket challenge, I am not going to reward a coffee cup to anybody because I won. I'm not a believer in second place winners. That's like giving away a second place trophy. So if I do take the crown of the bracket challenge, I guess I'm going to get me a nice coffee cup. As long as you actually get one this, this time, man. <laughs> and, uh, Banks, do you want to you want to spill the beans, or you want to just wait? We should probably tell him, Zach. Your coffee cup is on its way. Zach won the bracket challenge in 2019 and did not receive a coffee cup, but he will be receiving one. It is on the way. Fantastic! That just turned my march from sadness to gladness right there. And, and folks, <laughs> these these coffee cups, Chad, you can vouch for me. It, they're really nice. It's not one of those small coffee cups with the small handles. It's one of those big coffee cups that you can get your hand through. It's got those big handles. It's it's an expensive coffee cup, Zach. I think you'll really enjoy it. I may never sleep again. That's how much use I'm, I'm looking forward to getting out of this thing. Well, it's been a crazy March Madness. What do you guys think of this unique tournament so far that we've had this year in terms of there being no fans? And, of course, we're playing all of these games in one location. How do you think that's affected this March Madness? I think it's been crazy, man. Uh, you already looked. You had uh, the Oregon game right off the bat got canceled um, due to COVID. I mean – just the pure, just, it's different. There's not very many fans there. There's, uh, you know, the arenas are empty. So you're treating, you're seeing true basketball right now. And there's not, you know, there's not the loud screaming and stuff, which as many close games as there have been, it's something like you would usually just, I mean, the crowds would be going crazy. You know, the crowds would be going crazy cheering for the underdogs. And it's kind of cool to still see the underdogs winning right now, even without the crowd. So it's one of those things I'm enjoying it and it's probably probably been one of the most fun March Madnesses I've seen in a while. 
I have to agree with you there. It's it's been a such a different March Madness, and I think we've not had it in so long. I, I'm feeling like it's one of my top five March Madnesses of all time too, and that's so weird to say because the team that I love to watch the most. Uh, UK is not in it, but again, it's almost like it's uh, no pressure watching the tournament. You can kind of relax, just watch it without e- with, with ease. So I definitely see where you're coming from there. Uh, the fact that there are no fans, I think that's what's affected everything the most. Um, I've been calling it gym ball all year, but look at our teams. Look at the seeds that have advanced to the Sweet 16. If you're here to tell me that fans don't play an effect on the game, it does. It has all season, and we're still seeing it in March Madness. Absolutely. And, I mean, in terms of the the experience and the quality of it, for me, it's kind of like a glass half full, glass half empty thing. Um, uh, college basketball has been my favorite sport since the get-go, and I don't have a problem with having, you know, March Madness the same as it's always been, having their packed arenas, um, just the atmosphere that comes with it. That's what makes it great. Uh, but at the same time, I'm just happy to have March Madness. And it, it's a shame to see things like teams having to forfeit and stuff like that, but it's better than nothing. Um, and I think you guys hit the nail on the head. I also think team chemistry and um, like some of the intangible stuff is playing more of an effect. I think there's definitely teams that are more talented that have lost because maybe they just didn't want to be there. They were done with all the uh, quarantining and isolating and stuff like that. And then, that's given an opportunity for teams that maybe aren't as talented, but that want to be there, that want to win, that are willing to do what it takes. Um, you're, I think you're seeing some of them shine. Let's talk about the teams, the blue blood teams that aren't in the tournament this year. You have Kentucky out, Duke out, Louisville out, three big blue bloods there. Do you think that the lack of success from these blue blood programs is good for college basketball? Or do you think that it's bad for college basketball? Ooh, can I have this one real quick? Oh, so you anyway. forgot to mention one. You forgot to mention one. Kansas. Uh, Kansas went down by 34 points last night. 34 yes. points. Oh. They just got completely and absolutely throttled by USC. By all three of the Mobleys or all eight of the Mobleys. How many different <laughs> Mobleys are on that team? <laughs> Brothers, too, the dad, bro. the mom, everybody. I feel like everybody's <laughs> on that team. But they, I've never seen such just a pure better basketball team than Kansas. And honestly, that's the best thing that could have happened, especially for Kentucky this year, is these big blue bloods, you know, none of them were that good. But it's all the thing where all these schools that are recruiting one and dones every single year just didn't have it this year. And it's because, in my opinion, that they didn't have the time on campus. They didn't have the time in, you know, the summer to be able to go out there and truly participate in everything and be able to make their team you know, be able to make the full team thing actually work. So it feels good not to see Kentucky being the only school struggling. You saw UNC, Duke, Kentucky, Kansas, Michigan State, uh, you know, a lot of these big blue bloods that are usually in the tournament at this point still struggle. But it felt no better than seeing Kansas lose last night. (laughs) I mean, do you think overall – that this has helped college basketball, seeing teams like the Oral Roberts of the world and uh, the Creightons of the world get into the Sweet 16. Do you think that because of the absence of Duke and Louisville and Kentucky, it's given a chance to these smaller schools? I think it has helped college basketball. A lot of people say, oh, it's hurt it. It, it's hurt it. No, I always think it's better when you have new faces, new teams. Uh, it, it's just when you see the same old, same old, it, it can get a little stale. So I think it's it's helped. Zach, what do you say? Um, I would agree with you in the short term. I think it's fun for one season to have a different group of teams in there. But um, I think it's also important for like the long-term health of college basketball that this is kind of the exception rather rather than the rule of having different teams in there um, every year. You know, I mean, I think having the Dukes, especially Kentucky, you know, when if Kentucky is playing in the fight, like it's cool to watch the underdogs, but when you get a final four of all blue bloods, I bet the TV ratings are probably, uh, I, I bet they're actually probably higher for that. I mean, same thing with like, you know, baseball, you know, everybody gets sick of the Yankees always being there, but that's what brings in the money. So um, I think it's cool for a one season thing, but if it was Duke, North Carolina, Kentucky, and Michigan State next year in the final that final four, that'd be cool too. All right, folks, we're going to get 
right down to it. Let's grab our brackets. Let's work through it. Let's see. Uh, the, let's talk about the 16 teams left, and let's talk about how they got there. But we're going to take a quick break before we do that. Everybody stick with us. We'll be right back after these words. On the face of my city, co-signed by Diddy, hard liquor, I'm sh- Hotel with some bitty, got to doing my bidding. You change, no kidding. Welcome back, everybody, to Off the Cuff. Adam Banks here with you, also joined by my professional sports panel, and I use that word professional loosely. Zach Kahn, Chad Rainwater, and Jordan Canasser. We're, let's get right to it, guys. We're talking about the Sweet 16. The, oh, there's only 16 teams left, but let's talk about how they got there. The most exciting time of the tournament, the first two rounds. I want to start off talking about my alma mater, Moorhead State University, taking on West Virginia. Uh, Because of Miles McBride, he made sure that Moorhead State did not see the second round. The six-foot-two sophomore, he made his first five shots and finished 11 for 17 from the floor with six rebounds and six assists. He was the player of the game. West Virginia pulled away and beat Moorhead State 84-67 to in the first round round on Friday night, securing Bobby Huggins' 900th win. So it was a special game for Bobby Huggins. Uh, I was I was all in on Moorhead, guys. I posted the, the picture with me in the Moorhead State tee. I, I was all in on Moorhead. Uh, did you guys get a chance to watch that game? What did you think? Did you think they stood a chance? Um, we watched that game together, and uh, I'd never seen you be so excited and enthused about watching the game uh, in a long time, like even a Kentucky game. I mean, you were jumping up and down. It's because they're never there. Kentucky, they're always they're always there. But Moorhead, it's it's a rarity. Oh uh, yeah, and I understand it's your alma mater, and uh, and there for a while it did feel like Moorhead State was going to you know take take West Virginia down to the wire. But I mean, you're looking at. West Virginia, and like you said, led by Bobby Huggins. They were just, I mean, they were just too good for the Golden Eagles. Where is it? Eagles? Is it Golden Eagles or Eagles? It's the Eagles. Eagles? Okay. I'm, I'm, a, I'm sorry. I got them mixed up with uh, Oral Roberts. But, we yeah, it, was, it was a good game, but West Virginia is just too tough for them. That's the team I want to talk about right there is Oral Roberts. Has that not been the biggest? I mean, since first 15 seed since. Florida Gulf Coast in, what, 2013? Oral Roberts is solid. They're making a championship run. Calling it now. Oral Roberts. <laughs> I mean, I, I, think, I definitely think they're the sweet 16 of the tournament. But Oral Roberts, I mean, <laughs> gosh, yes, what a team they've had. Or what a time they've had so far in the tournament. Number 15 seed defeating Ohio State. A lot of people had Ohio State the Final Four. Some people had Ohio State the championship game. Uh, they also knocked off Florida, which I believe was a seven seed, uh, which was always great to see the Gators go down. I, I don't like the Gators, but I can get down with some Oral. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a fan of Oral. They have three players that are just absolutely crazy. They have, uh, all right, I got to look at, they got Max Acemas, the little point guard, and he just, he can get to the rim. He can beat the defender off the step, and he can get to the rim, and he's a playmaker. And they have the big guy, uh, O'Banner. Duke can step out. He can hit threes. He can back you down, hit a little hook. I mean, he's got everything. And then also you have the the Jurgens kid, and he just goes out there. He's a solid defender. And then he makes plays on offense whenever he has to. Honestly, I don't think it sounds crazy to think that Oral Roberts could be in your final four. I mean, it's not crazy. It's the first time in 47 years that Earl Roberts has seen the tournament, and there has to be a Cinderella. Why not? Why not it be Oral Roberts? But they have to get through the SEC. I mean, they they have to. They beat Florida, and now they've got to take down Arkansas. Are they going to be able to do that, Zach? Uh, it's going to be tough. I mean, anything can happen as we've as we've seen this tournament. But just you know. <laughs> Whether the second uh, 15 seed to ever make the Sweet 16, and there's never been one to make the Elite Eight, I don't see it happening this year. When you look at the teams on paper, Arkansas's not the best team, but uh, Coach Musselman's got a, a good squad out of Fayetteville, and uh, I think the Cinderella's coming to an end. I do. I mean, he definitely. Musselman's about to get out muscle. He definitely. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oral Roberts definitely took care of the Nicholasville native. 
uh, Chris Holtman, who is coaching mm-hmm. at Ohio State. Uh, Chad was telling yeah, me that I, he was from Nicholasville. I didn't know that. Yep. Well, but uh, as far as that goes, I mean, Ohio State, they lost, I think, four out of their last five coming into the tournament. Um, and then, really, Florida should have had should have had Oral Roberts. Uh, I want to say they had about 20 turnovers, I think, looking at the box score on that one. Um, Oral Roberts got to shoot more free throws. And I'm not saying the refs gave it to him or anything like that, but when, you, when you're relying on free throws to win, you can get the call. Sometimes you might not get them others. So um, if Arkansas comes out and plays their best game, I, I don't think Oral Roberts can hang with them. I'd, that'd be really cool if they did. I'd love to see an Oral Roberts Final Four run, but I wouldn't get my hopes up. <laughs> I'm just glad yeah, to s- – go ahead, Chad. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, I agree with what Zach was saying. I think uh, I think Musselman will find a way to stop uh, Ace Smith and O'Banner. I think that uh, Oral Roberts' run comes to an end. You know, this is a rematch of a regular season game earlier in the year, and Oral Roberts blew a 12-point second-half lead. Um, so, yeah, I don't, I don't think they'll be able to advance to the, to the lead eight. I'll see him blowing that lead this time. It's all Oral Roberts. It's all Oral Roberts, baby. And so are you. I was, way. I was also happy to see Mike White not get a Sweet 16 that he didn't deserve. I think there's there's other years he's deserved a Sweet 16 more than, than this one. So I'm glad he didn't get it this time. He might be on the hot seat. Billy Donovan made him care at Florida. He did. I mean, before Donovan, nobody cared about basketball, but he made him care. And in Mike White's tenure, he's only been there – uh, five years with one Elite Eight. So he's got to do something within the next year or two, and I'm talking a Sweet 16 or something, or or we might be seeing him lose his job. Uh, let's talk about the other SEC uh, team in the tournament, uh, Alabama, who some say is the best SEC team in the tournament. They played uh, Iona in the first round of the basketball tournament. Rick Bettino's Iona, number 15. It was Bettino's worst seed ever uh, going into the tournament. What did you guys think of that game? I think Alabama's – I mean, Alabama struggled through the first game, uh, but in the second half, you know, and this is a thing that I think is Alabama's, you know, the best thing about them, but it's going to be their biggest flaw when it comes down to it because they get on a hot streak. They start hitting threes, you know, they – they shoot a lot of threes, but I think it's going to be the ultimate killer that's going to hurt them throughout this tournament at some point in time. Um, but, you know, they ended up beating uh, Iona by like 13, mm-hmm. it looks like. And 55, the 68. Game, they, pretty much had, they pretty much had control of Maryland the entire game. But, uh, you know, with this upcoming game, UCLA is also a team that likes to shoot threes with Johnny Juzang, you know, just getting out there and just – shooting the open shot. So I think Alabama's going to have a little bit more of a competition than they've had in their first two games. But, you know, if Alabama's hot, they're hot. Yeah. But, you know, I'm just waiting. If they're not hot, how are they going to do? Well, That's what scares me about Alabama. Before the Iona-Alabama game, I had a lot of faith in Patino. Uh, how about Rick Patino, a guy who hit rock bottom, clawed his way back into the tournament, I was looking at this year maybe like the year he took Providence and Billy Donovan to the Final Four back in 1987 as a sixth seed. Uh, But again, this was too much for Patino to overcome. He was the worst seed he ever had. Uh, And Herb Jones, uh, he ended up out coaching Patino in this one. And and, and, I'm sorry, um, Nate Nate Oates. Nate Oates ended up out coaching him in this one. Who who Nate Oates, ladies and gentlemen, who is new at Alabama, only been there what two or three years. Uh, maybe this is his second year. He was that coach at Buffalo that had all those great yeah. runs. So uh, I thought it was a oh, um, it was an exciting game to watch. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, as far as Patino goes, I'm looking. Iona well, last year was 12 and 17. So. For Patino to come in, not really. I mean, if he got to recruit, it was uh, thrown off by the whole uh, COVID situation as well. So, I mean, he's really came in and took a 12 and 17 team and turned him into a conference champion. Um, and I think that really speaks to his, uh, the, the obvious like basketball IQ, X's and O's type of coach that he is, um, that he could come in and just, I mean, not, not that it's a super strong conference, probably one of the weaker ones in, uh, in division one, but still, I mean, they're no, you know, it's not slouches or, you know, it's not like going to the park and just winning a game. 
Um, you know, they won 12 games out of a full schedule last year, and then they won the same number of games in, a, in an abbreviated schedule this year. So Patino still got it. He still got it. He still he still got it. I, and we will see him back, and we'll see him with a better seed, and we'll see him advance. So I, I think college ba- basketball is better with Patino in there. So because of that defeat over Iona, Alabama uh, took on Maryland, and they drained three points the whole way. Uh, 96-77 to 77 was the final score of that game. Uh, the leading scorer for Alabama was sophomore guard Jaden Shackleford with 21 points. Uh, so now, who who is Alabama facing? UCLA in the Sweet 16. Woo! First four, UCLA. I told you guys when we started the show last week that uh, BY, was it BYU that... that yeah. Uh, yeah, BYU. <laughs> they got screwed. UCLA shouldn't have been a first four. They were ranked better than that throughout the year. And, and now that UCLA Sweet 16 prediction has come true. Do you think Alabama's going to defeat UCLA, though? I took the wrong first four team throughout the get-go. I took uh, Michigan State over UCLA. But either one of those teams, I just happened to pick Michigan State. And I thought, you know, Tom Izzo was going to take just another tournament run. But I chose the wrong first four team. I have, uh, at this point, I have UCLA defeat Alabama. And I have UCLA being a real contender for Florida State or Michigan whenever they get done with that game. They look good. I mean, everything about them have looked good. Uh, All, the whole Pac-12 is looking strong. It makes exactly. UCLA, is, yeah, it makes them look better. What are they, 9-1 and one now? <laughs> yeah, something like that. And uh, that was another challenge with this on kind of a sidebar. Is there were so few um, non-conference games this year that you just didn't see something like that coming. Um, but it really does bode well for, for UCLA in this one. And, but I, I mean, I, I kind of agree with what Jordan said earlier. It just depends on how Al- Alabama shoots. If they go out and make, you know, 12, 15 threes. Like they have been. Beat them. Like they have yeah, been. But yeah. if, if, they, if they shoot five for 30 from three, well then, yeah, I think UCLA probably pulls that one out, but it should be a good game. That's one of the best ones for sure. I mean, Alabama, SEC, I could really see Alabama winning it all. Uh, a lot of people bet the farm on Tennessee, thinking that that was the best uh, team, uh, the SEC team in the tournament. Who was it that took out Tennessee? It was uh, Oregon State, or- another Pac-12 team that just happened, that was terrible during the regular season, just happened to win their conference championship. And I don't even think that one was close, really. Exactly. 56 to 70, beat them by 14. And I'm, just watching it, Tennessee never really had a lead. They just kind of – it was a full game of just Oregon State just beating them down. I mean – Yeah, and then Oregon State goes on to beat Oklahoma State, who a lot of people um, with Cade Cunningham and the, some of the talent that they have uh, had as a, as a team that can make a deep run. But instead, it's Oregon State that's in the Sweet 16 now. So, hey, sh- hats off to the to the Pac-12. Yes, and let's – Go ahead, Jordan. Nothing about Oregon State surprise. Like nothing about them impresses me. That's the thing that's killed me about Oregon State throughout this tournament. Uh, nothing about Oregon State surprise. Like impressed me at all. I uh, just they don't have that star player. They don't have just that one specific person you just look at. It's just I'm not quite sure how they're still doing it, but they're doing it. But they're not making it past uh, Loyola Chicago. That team's that team's legit. On fire oh, yeah. again, Sister Jean back. This time she's a hundred and fifty years old instead of hundred and forty nine. <laughs> but she's back. There's gotta be something to that, right? I mean, is she really a, a good luck charm? Gotta be. It's gotta be she gotta be blessed or something. Uh, has she been I haven't got to unfortunately, like everybody's saying Loyola Illinois was the game of the tournament so far. I haven't got to watch any of the Loyola games in person. Is she actually attending like in person she sure is and she didn't get to attend any all year because of covid but she is attending she's 101 year old for anyone who is questioning whether or not covid is a really dangerous virus look at sister jean uh, no uh, please i'm <laughs> no, no doctor no, they, i'm no doctor it, it, she's taking a big risk with it she's taking a big risk with it for sure i would say for anybody that's still terrified uh, you know a uh, and saying, uh, are things worth doing? Hey, Sister Jean, she made her decision. She's If she's going out, it's going to be out at a Loyola game. Um, which, hey, 
I, it's awesome. That's a great storyline for college basketball. She's she is like the best college basketball fan of all time. For sure. And she might not be back ever into the tournament, even if Loyola continues to make it. She is 101 years old. I think that's amazing. Anytime you got somebody that up in age, I think that's just fascinating. Uh, it could p- quite possibly be, though, the Illinois versus uh, Loyola g- game was the – it could be the uh, game of the – tournament. Uh, But let's talk about Illinois for just a second. They were the first number one seed to go down. Did anybody have that in their bracket? The number one first seed, Illinois going down. Okay. Everybody thought they was at least going to advance. I think I had Michigan as my first number one seed going out, but I didn't have Illinois advancing that far. Uh, I'd only seen Illinois play like once this year, so I wouldn't. I didn't know too much. I know Orlando Antigua was an assistant coach for them. I know they've got a couple key pieces and stuff like that. But honestly, after watching Loyola Chicago in the very first game, and they have the the Crutwig guy, uh, Cameron Crutwig, he's their big guy on the team, and he is an absolute absolute phenomenon player, like a phenomenal player. He just he does everything on the court. I was sitting there and I was like, man, I was like. Just watching this guy, like I've, I've not seen Loyola Chicago play all this year, and it's getting close to halftime, and this guy's got like 14 points, eight rebounds, and six assists, and I'm just – I mean, he was everywhere. He oh, was the passing from the high post was incredible. He's Larry Bird, uh, like a bigger version of Larry Bird. I mean, it was, not on that level, but he played like it. Why hasn't Indiana picked up the phone – and dialed Coach Porter Moser to ask him when he can be there in Bloomington. I I don't understand it. I agree with you on that. I I have no clue. That's I'm you know uh, it's we've had the discussion before. Um, the uh, old coach or the Boston Celtics coach. Uh, I'm having Stevens. Uh, Brad Stevens. Uh, you know, something like that. Like he made a couple championship games, but this coach at Loyola Chicago has been winning. He's he's bringing players in, and he's winning with them. at Loyola Chicago. What's Indiana doing right now? That's what I'm saying. And uh, between the two, Brad Stevens, Poser, I think that Brad Stevens is the best coach. I think more realistically, Indiana has a better shot of getting Poser over over Stevens because of the money issue and mm-hmm. and plus the whole NBA thing. But yeah. I think that uh, that they're f- fools if they don't at least entertain the idea. All right, guys, we're going to have to take a quick break. We'll be right back after these words. Stick with us. Yes. yes. Shorty knows she with the best. Logo, I feel like Jerry West. She going to blow this whistle like a rap. Welcome back, everybody, to Off the Cuff. Adam Banks here with you, also joined by my professional sports panel, Chad Rainwater, Zach Kahn, and Jordan Canasser. I am broadcasting from the WLXU studios. They are joining me via Zoom at their homes. We are talking about the first couple of rounds of the NCAA men's basketball tournament. We've been discussing plenty of the games. Guys, number one seed Gonzaga is still in there. They're still undefeated. Four wins from perfection. Four wins from perfection. Are they going to pull it off? What do you think? I think that this is uh, Gonzaga's tournament to lose, you know. I mean, they're getting some of the harder teams that were in the region knocked out. I mean, they had to play um, – well, who, crap. Oh, Oklahoma – not Oklahoma State. Who did they just play yesterday? I can't Oklahoma. Oklahoma. Oh, Oklahoma, yeah. I mean, Oklahoma was out without their second lead in score. And uh, – I, I think that Oklahoma, that game yesterday was probably Gonzaga's toughest, toughest opponent up until, you know, the Final Four. And the last time this has been done was Indiana? Or my Indiana mind? in 73. Long, yeah. long time ago. Uh, let's see. Fellow top seed Michigan used a late second half run to pull away from LSU for an 86-78 to win. Uh, the last... SEC team to talk about LSU. I struggled with that one. LSU versus Michigan. I thought LSU uh, would give them a good game, and I was right, but Michigan ended up uh, pulling it off. I've seen in the Off the Cuff Bracket Challenge, a lot of people have Michigan as their champion. Just curious, does how far do each of you have Michigan going? 
I made, uh, you know, I had my predictions on the show last week. I did not have Michigan in it, but I actually, in my off the cuff bracket challenge, I changed things up a little bit just to went went a little bit crazy with it. I actually have Michigan as my champion in there just because I like Juan Howard and I feel like he brings a different energy to the tournament and I like the energy as a coach that he brings to the tournament to his kids. So I put them uh, winning it. You know, Gonzaga is good this year. I think Gonzaga and Baylor both head over heels of everybody right now. Mm -hmm. They look bigger, faster, stronger than every team in the tournament. But uh, in my off the cuff bracket challenge, I actually did have Michigan winning the championship. Wow, gotcha. Yeah, sometimes you have to go with a, a bit of a different team. Like you got to try to take an angle that other people aren't taking. But the the reality to me is that it's Gonzaga, and then it's everybody else. Um, that's what it looks like so far. Um, as far as Michigan specifically goes, Juwan Howard's awesome. He's off to an incredible start. Uh, with his first couple years at Michigan, but I'm mean, their best player, like or their leading scorer at least, Isaiah Livers. I believe he's out for the entire tournament. So even though they looked good yesterday against LSU, and that's who I had beating him, Jordan, I got on on the bandwagon with you on that. I don't. I think they're kind of like I just don't see them making it out of the Final Four. I think they may not. They may not be able to uh, to beat Florida State, who looked very impressive yesterday against Colorado. Florida State looks good right now. Yep. I've got it stopping for Michigan in the Sweet 16 because of Florida State. I think that their run ends uh, ends there. And uh, Baylor, like you were saying, Jordan, they look great. I honestly didn't think they would make it through the first round, though. Or, I'm sorry, the second round because of North Carolina. But North Carolina didn't even make it to the second round to play them. Uh, but, yes, Baylor's also looking good, too. I think if we're talking just of – who I wouldn't care at all to see win at all, it would be Baylor because I think that the coach of theirs, he's very humble. I think they're a clean program. And I I wouldn't mind being all in on the Baylor, the Baylor Bears. I don't want anything about Baylor winning it. Uh, Baylor is just a team that I just don't think I like. But it's also they're playing Villanova. I don't like <laughs> – I'm just not – for some reason, I'm not a Jay Wright fan. I'm not a Villanova fan. So – <laughs> but I honestly, I had uh, North Carolina coming out, Matt. I know in my off the cuff uh, bracket challenge, and I just realized North Carolina got beat by twenty three by Wisconsin, and it was never a game in the first round. It was never a game. Wisconsin completely controlled North Carolina. That's yeah, another yeah. one of your blue bloods that just got right. destroyed in the tournament. And I think that kind of, I, 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 when I did my research or whatever, North Carolina, I jumped on them. I had them in my final four. I did. I thought, well, why not? Okay. And. uh I think it may be an example of one of the blue blood programs where the guys just didn't want to be there. They're done with the season. They're done with uh, having to stay in their hotel rooms. It's on to the next thing for, for a team like that. Maybe, maybe Roy Williams didn't care. Who knows? But you're right. They didn't show up and Baylor. I got to agree with you, Banks. Uh, Scott drew. He's really cleaned up a program that if you look up the history of Baylor and the, like, their whole athletics department, it was bad. Like it was one of the, like we're talking like murders. Mm -hmm. like, it was bad. Uh, for him to turn around and give it a clean cut image, you got to like guys like uh, Jared Butler. I don't know if y'all know, have seen Matthew uh, Meyer. He's got a mullet. It's awesome. He's like the sixth man. That's uh, yeah. I, I'd like it if Baylor won. That's fantastic. Well, let's go ahead and give the audience and Chad. We'll start with you. Let's give the audience our updated Final Four predictions. Uh, it's, uh, it might sound a lot different than the Selection Sunday show because some of your Final Fours might be out. But let's go ahead and start with you, Chad. Who is in your final four? And go ahead and give us your champion, too. An updated final four. All right, so in the West, I'm sticking with Gonzaga. Just because, like Zach said, they're way up the top, and the other teams are pretty far behind them. And you notice the ball bouncing in the background. It's my daughter. Um, in the East, I'm going to go with uh, Alabama. Um, I think they'll beat Michigan in the lead eight. In the South, I'm going to go with... Baylor, and in the Midwest, I'm going to take. Uh, let's go with Loyola. Oh yeah, I think that, I think, I think that uh, they'll make Sister Jean's dream come true, and I think they'll that Porter Moser will get, Moser will get them to uh, their, um, their first ever Final Four. So that's my Final Four, my champion. I'm sticking with Gonzaga over Baylor. Okay. Um, in my in my initial bracket, I had Gonzaga beating uh, Illinois. 
uh, Illinois broke my heart. So now I'm going to switch that up and say we're going to beat Baylor in the championship game. I think that's fair. Zach, who do you got in your final four? And give us your champ. Um, I'll, I'll go with Gonzaga. Um, I'll do Alabama. I think they stay hot enough to get to the final four. Baylor, um, solid. And then uh, that last one, that's the tough, that's the tough one. I'm going to take, uh, I'll take Loyola. I mean, I just, I'm not sold on Houston, man. Rutgers almost got him right. That was like one of those sneaky picks I almost had. Uh, Houston, they're good, but they're not that good. Um, and then for champion, I'll take Gonzaga. Okay, and Jordan, who you got? I'm gonna go Gonzaga, uh, Florida State, out out of the East. They look they look tough. Mm-hmm. Uh, Baylor, and then I'm gonna I'm gonna go Banks. You got to make a consensus. Loyola Chicago is going to the Final Four, baby. Jordan and I have the same exact Final Four prediction: Gonzaga, Florida State, Baylor, and Loyola for me. So great minds think alike there. You got to go with Loyola. I'm going to go ahead and say Gonzaga's going to win it all. But, hey, it's going to be Loyola versus Gonzaga. I'm very excited to see that. And, hey, what a fun. I, would love it. I, I, love it. I would love it. And uh, Posner would be the hottest name out there in coaching if he oh, yeah. made it to another Final Four. He did make it to the Final Four two years ago, so if he does it again, it's going to be some great stuff. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we got one more segment to go, and we're going to talk about it. We'll be right back after these words. Stick with us. I'm thanking God that he made you part of the plan. I guess I ain't go through all that hell for nothing. Welcome back, everybody, to Off the Cuff. Adam Banks here with you, along with my professional sports panel, Zach Hahn, Chad Rainwater, and Jordan Canasser. I'm broadcasting from the WLXU studios, and they are all broadcasting via Zoom at their homes. All right, the Sweet 16 teams have been set, and we have been talking about how they all got there because they each got there just by a battle or some kind of upset or surprise, but... Like I said, the Sweet 16 has been set, and they are. Let me just go ahead and list them off for everyone who don't know. This is just quickly who we have in the Sweet 16. Uh, And, of course, the notes that I had on my Sweet 16 are not on the one that I grabbed, but we have Gonzaga, Creighton, USC, Oregon, Michigan, Florida State, UCLA, Baylor, Nova, Arkansas, Oral Roberts, Loyola, Oregon State, Syracuse, and Houston. That is a heck of a Sweet 16. Sweet as candy, guys. It's going to be a fun Sweet 16. There's going to be a lot of good games. Uh, You know, I'm just looking at it. I'm excited for Michigan and Florida State game. Uh, I'm excited for Baylor, Villanova. I'm excited for Arkansas, Oral Roberts. Uh, and then I think Syracuse and Houston is going to be the most interesting game. Buddy Beheim, Buddy Buckets is ridiculous. He's been killing it this tournament. He's been killing it throughout the season. He takes 47 shots a game. He shoots from everywhere on the floor. The coach is his dad. He does, He just he lets him shoot from wherever he wants on the floor, and it's fun to watch. Couldn't have said it better myself. They are the sweet, and hopefully they will turn into the elite. Zach, did you have something to say about the Sweet 16 before we moved along? Oh, I was going to say I uh, I hated on Syracuse in the in the first episode of this because I said Jim Beheim's old. He's he's like the crabby old man in college basketball now, and that just <laughs> irritates me even more that his son goes out there and just ball hogs it up. Go Cougars, go Houston. <laughs> I know I hated on them too, but I, I know who I'm rooting for in that one. I'm I'm excited for Oregon and USC myself. That's going to be a I great matchup. Think, uh, I actually picked Syracuse as my sleeper slash Cinderella team. I don't consider them a Cinderella team just because, you know, they're a pretty big program, but we'll say they're a sleeper. And it looks like that uh, they're in one of those 2016 uh, runs where they were one of the 10 seed. Made I think this, they've done this before where they went from the, the play-in game to, to greatness. They have. They have. Uh, and Bayheim is one of those coaches that you just can't count him out. He's a legendary Hall of Fame coach. But speaking of coaches, 
This is the time for coaches to get hired and coaches to get fired. The coaching carousel is in full effect. I think one of the biggest names or one of the biggest programs available right now, we talked about it, Indiana. We talked about already who we think they should hire. I think it's between uh, Loyola's coach, Poser and uh, Brad Stevens, if that's even uh, something realistic that could happen. Uh, but a lot of... Uh, a lot of uh, coaches fired. There was Archie Miller from Indiana. He got fired. Uh, Greg Marshall from Wichita State, he resigned. So uh, Greg Marshall was available. Uh, Tommy Dempsey with Birmingham was fired. Jim Christian with Boston College was fired. Uh, Tony Jasek with Jacksonville College fired. Uh, Dave Polson with George Mason fired. Uh, Steve Wojowski Whatever last name that is from Marquette. <laughs> I don't think that's it. <laughs> fired. And uh, uh, Richard Patino with Minnesota fired. I-, I was sad to see that. I'm a big Richard Patino fan. You saw Richard Patino's already. He's, I think he's already got. Uh, he was, he was uh, unemployed for about six hours before he picked up at uh, New Mexico State. Absolutely. I didn't no, think he'd New be. Mexico. New, oh, New Mexico. I didn't think that he would be uh, av- unavailable long or available long. Uh, he he got picked up pretty quickly. Uh, Zach, what do you think about that hire? Uh, I think that was a great hire for New Mexico. I mean, look, I, I don't know what it is, but it's just hard to win in Minnesota. Uh, before uh, Richard Pitino was tubby, like they just got to take their – you know, getting making half the NCAA tournaments and winning a game here and there. Like, I don't I, – I appreciate what they want to be. They want to be a top of the Big Ten team, but I don't think they'll ever be that. Um, so, I got to tell you, Banks, my – like, well, I, I'm not saying I want it, but it would be an interesting thing. So, like, what if UK has another bad season next year, right? And then right. we steal – we steal Rick from uh, – from Iona, uh, and we got to keep the compliance department intact, right? Like that's the that's the <laughs> asterisk yeah. there. But uh, not with uh, Mitch Barnard. So Rick has like three good seasons at UK. Meanwhile, Richard's tearing it up in New Mexico, maybe getting like an elite eight out of that. And then hey, we used to have a whole like the the original Patino era got cut short. But hey, maybe maybe we get a whole like Patino like twenty years from them too, and and take UK back to the top. So. Hey, I got a, I got a dream. You got a dream big in March. Uh, it's like a palace. The college That's a basketball, the, the college, <laughs> it's a nightmare. The, the college basketball <laughs> palace, the Patino Royal Air. Uh, a lot of people like the Patinos. Uh, I, I'm a fan of Rick Patino, and I'm also a fan of his son Richard. I think he's a good coach, um, but I wouldn't mind seeing him at UK. I like that theory. Hey, I'm we'll not a Rick it's fan. A, I'm a Rick fan. It's a hot take. <laughs> it is it is a hot take. Uh, just a few more names to list. Uh, there are a couple more uh, coaches lost their jobs. Uh, let's see. Earl Grant, he was coaching Carl of Charleston. He left for Boston College. Uh, Rob Murphy with Eastern Michigan has decided to mutually part ways with the program. Mark Montgomery was fired from Northern Illinois. Murray Garvin was fired from South Carolina State. Uh, let's see. And finally, the last one that I could find here on my coaching carousel was uh, from Texas State, Danny Casper. He resigned uh, from the Sun Belt. But the coaching carousel in full effect, this is the time for coaches to get that big job. It's amazing that your whole career could be catapulted to the moon with just doing well, just doing a one Good, well performance in March. It's amazing how fast that could catapult your career. Don't you guys think? Mm-hmm. Seen it happen many a times before, and you know, it's uh, um, yeah, the loyal Chicago coach Porter Moser. He's, I think, he's about to cash out, and I honestly think the Indiana job's going to come down to Porter Moser or Rick Pitino. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Uh, you know, I think that. As of yesterday, it looked like Indiana was about to hire Thad Mata, a former Xavier and Ohio State coach, but he felt his physical. Um, so I think that now they have to give old Porter Moser a call because he's really the only – he's not even a big name, but he's had so much success, and, you know, including this year with the postseason. I just think that that's only the really only – that's really their only option. I mean, Brad Stevens has already rolled out – Going to Indiana, he says he's not leaving Boston. And with that, why not? 
and, and New, yeah, right, and, right. I mean, Indiana fans, Indiana fans thought they had him as their coach. Like they were for certain they were going to get him. And really and, quick, uh, uh, before I'm sorry, really quick before we stop talking about the coaching carousel, Richard Patino. We talked about how much we liked him. One of the reasons I like Richard so much is because he still rocks the suits. And the three-piece suits. Oh, did he rock them this year? I didn't watch any of their games. He did. He rocked them just like his dad did. Patino, when he played with Iona, he 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 rocked the suits, man. Patino ain't putting on no pullover, no hoodie. <laughs> and uh, I just think you that take the game seriously. He does, and Richard he takes it he takes it serious. But guys, that about wraps it up for this episode discussing the first and second round of the NCAA Men's Basketball Tournament. Uh, We are broadcasting from the WLXU Studios 93.9 FM. uh, 8 o'clock, primetime special, the March Madness Series. We'll be back next Thursday at 8 p.m. to discuss what happened during the Sweet 16 and the Elite Eight. We'll talk about all of those games, and again, we'll preview our Final Four and give you our predictions, and we'll see how right we were or how wrong we were. But... Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening to another episode of Off the Cuff. You can catch the show next Thursday at its regular time, 4 o'clock, and then uh, the March Madness series will air three hours later at 8 o'clock. So we've got double the fun next Thursday. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Adam Banks. That is Zach Kahn, Jordan Canasser, Chad Rainwater, and we will all see you next Thursday from 8 to 9 right here on the March Madness series, Off the Cuff.